Hello, everyone. So glad you could join us today. Um, you have joined the Flex Quality Networking Council meeting, and we have a great program uh, in store for you today. I'm Becky Royer, and I support the Medicare Beneficiary Quality Improvement Project for the State Office of Rural Health. So want to make sure and thank Joyce Fillenworth and David Conrad for all of their support to all of the rural hospitals and all of their support to us in being able to provide these sessions. Our topic for today is HCAPS, both for the emergency department and hospital inpatient patient experience, as well as we're going to touch on star ratings, calculations, and some important information to know there. Uh, we do ask that you enter your name and your hospital into chat so that we can take a more accurate attendance. Um, and show the num true number of attendees that are on, as well as if there's more than one person in the room with you, please let us know their name as well. So again, we can gain accurate attendance at our program. Um, so I wanna thank Allie Orwig with the Indiana Rural Health Association for supporting us uh, in the Zoom platform and kind of taking care of things in the background. So thank you, Allie. So presenting for us today is Janelle Shearer. Uh, Janelle shared um, part one on HCAPS for uh, both the ED and inpatient. I did include the recording to that event in the calendar invitation for today. So if you were not able to join that session, I really encourage you to do to go back and listen to that as well. She provided some great information. We're gonna pick up for part two here today. And I'll give you just a little bit of Janelle's background. I did share her bio in the invitation too, but Janelle works for Stratus Health, who has been an organization that has supported rural on a national basis for several number of years. And they're the national support group for um, the all of the states and the state offices of rural health that support the FLEX program. So we really appreciate everything they do and represent rural for us. Janelle has a really extensive background leading quality improvement initiatives related to hospital, home health care, patient safety, and palliative care. And she's led multiple community-based initi initiatives and recently co-led a multi-state rural community-based palliative care initiative and a statewide coordination of care initiative. So she really has a lot of knowledge around all of the elements of patient experience around HCAPS and has been a wealth of knowledge. Stratus Health has also worked with a number of high-performing critical access hospitals over the years and done an excellent job of summarizing what those best practices have been so that they have achieved and maintained those high scores. So Janelle, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, but I do encourage everyone to open up chat, chat in any questions you have, you can also unmute your line by hovering at the bottom of your screen. And on the left-hand side, there's a microphone that you can unmute yourself. Likewise, if you open up that participant list, you can also unmute yourself um, next to your name by clicking on that microphone button that has a line through it. So at this time, Janelle, take it away. Thank you, Becky. And hi, everybody. Thanks for having me back. So I'm just curious how many were here for part one, which was the end of May. If you could like raise your hand, use the little emoji and raise your hand or just even literally raise your hand if you have your camera on, which I don't think too many people do. I was just kind of curious about that. Okay, thank you. Let's see some hands. So um, thanks for the introduction, Becky, and I'm happy to be back. We there was so much information in the first session that I felt like I was talking a mile a minute that we didn't get done to it. So we decided to do a part two. But one question I brought up when I first came, when I first started was, it was like a little quiz and it was how many um, states, how many, let's see, critical access hospitals are there in the US? 
and you guys put your answers in chat and then I was going to give you the answers at the end. And then I realized later that I never was able to do that. So if, I'll give you just 30 seconds if you want to make a guess what are the five states that don't have critical access hospitals and then I'll tell you the answer before we go on. And I see people are still putting their hospitals in where they're from. So if you want to take a guess or um, I'll just give a give you a few seconds to do that. Okay, I see some coming in. And sometimes it's not going to be totally the obvious. New York, Wyoming, California, New York. Okay, so I won't keep you in suspense any longer. They are the five states that don't have critical access hospitals. And that means they don't have flex programs either. It's Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland. I mean, you can kind of get it right there on the East Coast, New Jersey, and Rhode Island, and some are pretty tiny as well. Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. All right, so now you know. <laughs> okay, you can advance the slide, Becky. And these first couple, I'm just going to like buzz through them because um, in the introduction, basically we're a quality and safety organization. Pretty much everything we do is with the lens of helping healthcare providers improve care for their patients. And so we, um, our company has state, let, uh, federal and local grants where we do our work through. The next slide talks about why I'm here today and it's this role of quality, rural quality improvement technical assistance center. Basically we provide technical support to the flex program uh, coordinators and, and people like Becky in, in your state. And that's a part of uh, HRSA's um, Federal Office of Rural Health Policy Program. Okay, so our objectives today, uh, we did not change these from last time. So we're gonna just finish up on the ED and HCAPS uh, questions and some best practices. And then what I'd like to do is just hear from you on what are your best practices? Are there any different best practices that your hospitals have implemented that uh, the hospitals, the high performing hospitals uh, that shared with us um, something different that you're doing? And then we'll talk a little bit about, uh, so we'll be thinking about this, what best practices have you implemented related to patient and family engagement during the COVID-19 pandemic? So what are some things, and it's not like it's over and it sounds like you're having another little surge there, um, but what are some things you've implemented to help the patients and families have a better experience? And then I want to know, what do you think will stick if and when this pandemic is actually over? And then at the end, we'll touch uh, pretty high level on the star ratings and uh, just uh, have a little discussion about that. So recap, we'll do first, just high level recap of what we talked about in part one. And so we talked about, um, first of all, what they are, why they're useful, why they're important. We talked about the metrics. There are similarities and differences between them. Also different modes of survey implementation. So how you get the data from or collect the information from patients are different between each, the ED and the HCAPS. We also talked about the questions and you know, sometimes they're the same, but sometimes the answer choices are different uh, for the two questions between HCAPS and EDCAPS. And also talked about how they're scored and something called top box scoring. And then finally, we talked about the different strategies to improve patient experience when they're in the hospital or ED. And the information came from, now it's already been since 2017, our company um, had focus groups of high performing critical access hospitals, and we brought them together. It was a number of focus groups to find out what are they doing 
to have such good scores for the different categories. And that's where this information came from. And then just a little side note, I'm working on a project to update or refresh those, that information, because a lot has happened since 2017. So we're bringing, every, bringing some high performers together next Thursday and getting their feedback on what's different. And we're also asking them the COVID related question, like what are you, what are you keeping um, because of you know, COVID that you will have after the pandemic is over. Okay, so now we'll get into the new stuff for today. <clears throat> so in part one, we talked about HCAPs and ED caps and how they're used. Um, and now we're gonna move on to this overall rating and willingness to recommend area. So these are kind of separate and they're done on a slightly different scale. <clears throat> so people are asked using a number from zero to 10, where zero is the worst and 10 is the best, what number would you use to rate the care that you received on this visit? And so, you know, a patient can say anywhere from zero to 10, but you only get credit if you answer a nine or 10. So if you weren't here last time, the, the numbers in green, that's the scores you get the credit for. And then when they're asked, would you recommend this hospital emergency room to your friends and family? The answer choices are definitely no, probably, definitely yes. And there, there might even be a fourth one in there. I am not, I don't quite remember, but you get credit only if they answer definitely yes, they would recommend. Next slide. Okay, so these are called global measures. So they're really difficult to figure out exactly what it is. It's not a composite score, it's a separate question. So all the other questions about communication and all that, they're separate from these uh, global questions. So you could have a patient who answered positively, give you really high numbers on all the other questions. And then on the global measures, say they give you a seven on this one. And so then you're looking at the survey results and you're thinking, well, they gave us you know, all top box scores for all the other questions, but here we got a seven. What do we do with that? I mean, honestly, it's maybe not that likely to happen, but the point is these questions are independent of all the other HCAPs questions in the survey. So one thing you could uh, possibly do is work with your vendor from the data perspective to understand what is the correlation between responses on the rest of the survey to your global measure. So they'll be able to tell you things like, you know, say patients rated their nurse communication like really high, and then they had high global measures, or maybe they felt that their physician communication wasn't so positive and you tended to get lower global um, measures. So those kind of things, your vendor could help you look for correlation. So then if you did see correlation, you could work on those basic measures um, also to have um, higher global measures. Some of the behaviors, so now best practices are the items bulleted on the right. And just to orient you to this slide is the HE stands for hospital and emergency. They apply to both. So all three of these interventions apply to both the HCAPs and the emergency um, as well. Okay, so uh, some of the behaviors are things that we think are really helpful. So we think about leader behaviors. Is leadership really engaged in patient experience and really bought into it? Is there visibility and are they providing opportunities for development of staff? Are they rounding with staff when you do your, your patient roundings? Second one is, is you look at the culture. So what's the culture at your facility? Is there an understanding of standards of behavior around patient experience? Is there some uh, camaraderie and teamwork involved? Is there accountability? Does everybody know that patient experience is their responsibility and not just the responsibility of the quality department? And then some things related to data. So sharing data with staff and providers often includes uh, letting them know what questions are actually are on the survey so they understand how they're essentially being scored by their patients. 
do you take opportunities for discussion and suggestions from your staff? You know, so they can weigh in on something. You know, for example, maybe some staff might see something you're an area you're not doing very well on, but they would have an, a great idea on how you might make that work or make some improvement. And then just doing some general PDSA with your staff, testing different activities that your direct staff are going to um, be having an impact on with their suggestions for improvement. And then um, some of the hospitals are having friendly competition and building off of momentum when it happens. So celebrating when you do see an improvement in a particular area that you're focused on, or maybe there's a particular shift or team, maybe you notice scores are really great on the weekend. So you wanna acknowledge those staff and just provide that um, recognition for them. And think about what can you learn about when patients respond positively versus when they don't? Can you engage in some coaching or friendly competition to help drive your improvements further? Next slide. You did, Janelle, have a Janelle, I was gonna say we had a question in chat that you'll want to address. Is okay. the awesome. HCAP scores affect our CMS star rating? Oh, fantastic question. And we're gonna get into that in a little bit. The answer is yes, HCAPS fits into the over star rating. And when we get into the star rating, it's complicated, let me tell you how they calculate this and they've made some changes recently. But if you have enough server responses and you need 100 in the four quarters, so if you have the, that many for HCAPs, they will then get put into if you have enough responses for the overall star rating. So um, the answer is yes but many critical access hospitals don't have enough responses um, to fit into either overall or uh, sometimes even the HCAPs. Janelle, and, I'll and also share too that um, in talking with several hospitals and when we've been working on HCAPs improvements for uh, would you recommend the hospital and overall ratings, there's always a surprise when you've heard Everything went very well, but then these scores are lower. And yeah. so leaders have started when they conducted their patient roundings to also have kind of a script or kind of an explanation about what a critical access hospital really is and you know how maybe care could improve. But part of the challenge has been identifying the difference between alert the services provided by a critical access hospital and larger facilities. So it's that's been effective in providing kind of that type of discussion with the patient and kind of checking in on them and seeing how care is going on a personal level. So, and has made some good impact on scores. So I thought I would share that too. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks for watching the chat, Becky, as well. So let me just clarify a little bit again, the HCAP score is with the Overstar rating. It's one of the five categories of grouped um, measures. So there'll be more discussion <laughs> down the road. Okay, so overarching themes for HCAPs, uh, leadership and culture are key when it comes to patient experience. And just like you pointed out, uh, leadership being vis you know, visible, talking with patients, explaining it, and providing that scripting to staff sometimes is very helpful as well so they know how to respond. We want to assure that there is efficient and effective and clear and concise communication among team members with patients and families. When you have engaged employees and engaged staff, that goes a long way in towards improving the patient experience or having people have a better experience. And then there's also this notion about thinking about workforce with resiliency. And I'm not saying resiliency in the terms of just keep doing more with less, 
but are we giving staff what they need in terms of support when we're thinking about these patient experience surveys to be able to adapt in the memo when they need it? And again, that comes back to like scripting and support for them and explanations and providing them with the data and the information they need. And, you know, and then particularly thinking about how it all relates to COVID-19 and all the different changes that have happened for the patient experience when they're in the hospital or the ED there. So that's kind of it on finishes up our HCAPS and EDCAPS um, part. So here are some resources for HCAPS. The first one is the study of best practices uh, by the high performing hospitals that we did a few years ago that we're refreshing now. And there will be a new report that we'll release and um, we'll be getting that out to you. And then if you're interested in more details of how HCAPs are managed and the kind of guidelines and standardization that HCAPs online is your go-to resource for that. <clears throat> then the next slide shows the EDCAPs resources. So your com complete guide, the cms.gov. And then if you want some information about analytics and technology to improve the patient experience, there's a resource on that. And there was a comment um, in chat from Marcy. Can we share the scripting that others are using on explaining the difference of cause versus a larger hospital? And I'll be glad to do that, Marcy, when we um, when I send out the recording to the event, so everyone has that. And Janelle, if you have any that you want to share, uh, why please feel free to do that too. So, all right, I'll write that down if I have some more scripting. Because it, okay. it is. It is a different. Uh, it is an important difference to make um, because there are certain conditions and certain types of surgeries that patients think about, and when they're marking their HCAP scores, it's like, well, not all the time would I. So I just think it does a better job of explaining. And Janelle, we also might take some time uh, too. We discussed on the last call, but. There had been discussions at one point in time, and of course COVID has slowed everything down about having maybe a different HCAPS survey for critical access hospitals so that some of these general global questions aren't really kind of misrepresented as to what's really taking place at a critical access hospital. Yeah, and I, I did um, talk to my colleagues about that question, Becky, about a different or a new HCAPs just for critical access hospitals. And nobody's hearing anything about that. It really has more to do with kind of like the low numbers because many of the measures are relevant, although I know we are always pushing for more rural relevant measures. And that's maybe what you're kind of thinking about having measures that are more just for like a critical access hospital, but um, nothing's in the, the rumors about that at this point. And was your team able to uh, kind of discern then hospitals or critical mm -hmm. access hospitals in particular that have a larger than average return on their surveys, what some best practices were around that? Yes, yeah, and we talked a little bit about that um, last presentation as well, but there are some tactics and techniques you can do. Um, I mean, one thing is when leaders are rounding just even talk about it or at discharge. Yeah, there are a lot of little tip, tips that, pe that people do, that hospitals do to try to get pe your patients to respond. You know, one thing might be if you're doing texts, let them know what number it's coming from. I mean, or an email, like, yes, this is a legitimate email. It's gonna be coming from so-and-so. Okay, so I'd just like to open it up a little bit to, to ask what additional strategies are working for your hospital? What are some things you've done that maybe haven't been mentioned? Or if you have any tips, let's do that one first and then we'll go into the COVID one. 
And you can put your comments into chat and I'll be glad to read those off for you or uh, simply unmute your line by hovering at the bottom of the screen. And on the left-hand side, you'll find the microphone that you can click to unmute or in the participant list, you can also click unmute there too by clicking on the red microphone with a line across it. Janelle, I know that um, a strategy that some are using too is they have either a PFAC member or a volunteer also round on patients. Uh, great way to get feedback that isn't being asked by direct staff caregivers and um, just asking about their care, but they also saying, and you will get a survey um, regarding the care that's been provided to you by the hospital, please complete that and uh, send that back in. So having, having those volunteers or a PFAC member making rounds on patients occasionally has been helpful for some critical access hospitals too. That's a great one. And I don't believe that was on the list from the high performing hospitals. I don't recall that anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of great PFAC activities going on. I mean, the state. and just as a patient, if somebody tells you about it and they ask you to, you know, please complete it, you're probably more likely to do it, especially if you've made a, a connection. Okay, anything in the ch chat? Any additional? Not right now. And definitely include items from our last discussion too um, for any of the uh, measures, HCAPS measures. And I know last time there was great uh, um, feedback and ideas on what some of your hospitals are doing. Brooke shared that they are doing interdisciplinary rounding with each patient that is admitted daily. Definitely another good best practice. So I'm curious, Brooke, when you say interdisciplinary, how many people are, are making the rounds? So it's actually um, myself as the director, um, our discharge planner, a pharmacist, in case they have any medication mm -hmm. questions, and the therapy team, um, as well as a respiratory therapist. So it's basically all of the clinical team as well as um, our discharge planner to um, kind of help have that conversation of, you know, what they need at discharge. And we make sure to always use the always, you know, we always want to make sure that you're taken care of while you're here, but we also want to make sure that you're taking care of while you're at home. Mm -hmm. um, and we do that daily. We do it every morning at 10. Um, and that way the physician has had a chance to already round with the nurse. And so that kind of completes the disciplinaries with the fact that the physician and the RN of the patient has already been in. Awesome, I love that, thank you. And Marcy shared that they started doing interdisciplinary rounding here um, about Blackbird for our inpatient and it has been a great success and they have a set time. Thank you. So I'm curious, when you do the interdisciplinary rounding, do you let the families know too? So then our families coming in or calling in for the rounding with the patients? No, I guess we haven't, but that would be a great idea. I mean, we obviously include the family that's in there, but that would be something to let them know ahead of time. I mean, they participate if they're there, Yeah, but that would be a good strategy to add as well. Mm -hmm. we and Marcy here that families do participate in chat. Um, we started scripting and telling when on a mission that we do this every day at this time and we encourage families to be there, have your questions ready. Um, and I feel like everyone's on the same page and then we're not like, okay, when is this patient gonna get discharged? Um, I've gone on the rounding at times just to see how it's going. Um, it's led by the physician, but they call out every discipline and then they ask the family, do you have any questions before they leave? Nice, fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. 
Tally shared that on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, case management, social service, pharmacy, dietitian, the director, and RT do bedside rounding as well. The family's made aware and they do participate, which that's great. And I do know that um, a few of the hospitals that I've spoken to that do interdisciplinary rounds, they also make it a real point to update communication boards at that time mm -hmm. too, and have found that kind of to be helpful. And then Emily shared um, that they have been doing an interdisciplinary team daily huddle each day where they bring multiple departments together with the hospitalists and discuss plans for each patient. And they invite families in when needed to discuss any issues and also discharge planning. So that's great too. Great addition. Fantastic. Thank you guys for sharing that. Let's move into thinking about COVID and the pandemic and how things have changed uh, at hospitals. So what I want to know is what are some of the adaptations that you've made considering COVID-19? And we're thinking of the patient and family experience here. So what adaptations have you made? And then I also wanna know, what do you think you'll keep post-pandemic? And again, if you want to unmute and jump in. And Marcy shared, they added iPads for the patient to use when families can't come and visit. Very nice, very nice. So does everybody get an iPad, Marcy, or how, how does that work? No, we only have like a couple because of the cost, but um, we tell the you know patient, if you wanna reach out to your family, a lot of our patients are elderly and they're like, I don't know how to use it, but mm. we have trained the staff on how to use it. And especially during COVID, when we weren't allowing visitors, um, it really did help the patient. Because um, COVID really, you know, we stopped having visitors and I'm a firm believer of families being part of um, the patient's care, but not everyone feels that way, so. I have one question. I'm thinking of it like, so they have the iPad. What are, are you using, like FaceTime or Zoom or just a whole variety? So we had a variety. Um, we had um, Facebook Messenger. We had the um, FaceTime. And then we did have the capability of doing Zoom. We had our IT person do that for us. Okay, thank you. Andrea also shared that they were able to do some window visits. So that's very helpful too. And then um, also shared that cameras in the NIC, NICU, if I can talk here, so that's helpful too. Very helpful, just getting that face facial interaction. I know too, I recently worked with a hospital where during COVID, um, nurse bedside shift reports kind of went by the wayside and their age cap scores dropped dramatically. Mm -hmm. They really reinforced and modified how they were doing uh, the nurse bedside shift report and um, it was helpful. And then when COVID, the surge was over and they were really able to implement that nurse bedside shift report fully, they saw an increase in their HCAP scores come up. Weren't totally sure there was definitely a direct correlation between the two, but definitely it seemed to happen along that same time frame. So conducting those nurse bedside shift reports and really engaging the patient in their care and allowing them to interact and ask questions to both the um, uh, staff leaving and the staff coming on and just feeling comfortable with that transition does make a difference. Yeah. 
I'm wondering about the cameras in the NICU. So is that like a baby cam or something where the parents or family can just see what's going on all the time? Or tell me how that works a little bit more. For parents. So um, it is like a monitor, like a camera on the baby all the time. Is that what it is then? Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, I'm sure that brings them a lot of just comfort and relieving anxiety and stress, knowing <laughs> knowing things, what's going on, or knowing things are okay, or how how it's going. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, how about of these or maybe other things you've implemented? What are you keeping? What do you think you'll keep? when the pandemic is over. <laughs> We're assuming it will be. Do you think you'll keep iPads uh, so people can, you know, continue to talk to their families when they're not? Okay, iPads and telemedicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about is anybody using, you know, technology or the iPads for communicating, you know, like when the doctor, say the doctor makes rounds and the family can't be there, you know, either because of distance or because of visitor restrictions. Are folks using technology in kind of the same way for that? We haven't, but that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just think even in normal times, <laughs> it's, sometimes it's just not convenient or, or you don't know when the phys physician is making rounds, but if you could get a text or something that said the physician's making rounds, can you join and you could do it virtually. Family could be very a part of it, right? I know that there was a hospital too that they their case management team was providing their work cell phones so that patients could also text them during the day. And that kind of opened up some communication there too. And they received positive feedback mm -hmm. from that. But they had a number they left with a patient that if questions came up or family arrived that they needed to talk to, they could text them as opposed to trying to contact them through other means. And it seemed to be more efficient. And then the case management team could text some things right back and, mm -hmm. and uh, it seemed to work pretty well, at least there in the initial stages. Yeah, I love that. I mean, think how we've gone to text, right? So like today I had a, a workman was going to be coming and they said, he'll call you before he comes. And I'm like, well, could he just text, you know, so it's so much easier to respond by text versus a phone call or going into your email or something like that. Great suggestions. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. And I'll just share some of the things and the next one some of the things that um, we've been hearing. So one of the things first is like, if you have to, you know, when you do precautions, it's a lot has to do with how you word it. So instead of saying we're on restrictions or we're on lockdowns or something, you might say, talk about taking precautions to protect patients and families. So a lot of it is, you know, it's just about the wording. And then you want to be clear about what the changes are and what they mean. Like, what do they mean for that individual patient? Providing comprehensive and clear communication using a variety of mechanisms and channels, including regular updates. 
um, when things are changing, especially if like say things settle down, then we get another surge again. And so, you know, things have been in flux a lot. Now, preparing and supporting your staff working directly with patients, families, and the public to clearly and respectfully communicate changes in policy. So again, providing that support to your staff so they, they know what to say and they know how to respond. Um, perhaps you could give staff some simple scripting. You know, it might be something like we know people are maybe angry or frustrated, and they're also dealing with a very scary situation. Uh, but they have a loved one in the hospital or in the emergency department. And how can we make their experience you know, as good as, as we can? Um, so how can we provide our staff with the know-how? What tools can we give them so they can be responsive to patients at the moment when things might be tense or heightened? And then just even think about, um, and I'll let you go to the next slide, please. Um, developing policies and systems that would connect patients and families. So um, say you're, you're limiting visitors uh, to explain why you're doing those precautions. You know, one thing we talked about this a little bit uh, earlier is like connecting patients and families. And you think, okay, we're in 2022 and it's the idea of being able to have the family there, uh, I don't want to say virtually, <laughs> when the, either the rounding is happening or the physician is making the, the visit for the day. How can we do that? And is that something we want to keep doing? Also is to have when you do like say use the iPads or something like that, is there a designation of a care partner or essential caregiver role? Like who do we make the connection to? And then clear roles, who's responsible at our facility to do the facilitation? Is it the nurse? Is there somebody else that's the social worker, somebody else that's able to make that connection with the family? And then of course, you wanna document the, the patient's communication preferences and their contact information. So those are some of the tips on maintaining connections that we've heard um, from hospitals. And then on the next slide, we just have some uh, resources related to COVID-19. And there's a, there's a whole, whole bunch of them there. Okay, any other comments or discussion about uh, HCAPs or COVID-19 and adaptations that you've made or things you wanna keep? Janelle, one thing I was thought I might share, it just actually came to mind, but, and when I saw the Barrel Institute, it brought it forward was I attended the Barrel Institute annual conference this year, and there was a, an entire breakout session on lost items. And definitely if a patient loses glasses, a cell phone, or something personal that they brought in, rings, it really doesn't matter what kind of care you've provided, you're probably not going to get a good survey. And the cost to the hospital, and they, um, the hospitals that presented, there were three of them, and they had all added valuables to their communications board so that they could add in patient has glasses, hearing aids, you know, just some of those really key items that when lost, it's devastating to the patient and costly to the hospital. Um, but a place also to write in other personal items and then added in some scripting for staff that as they gathered their tray, they could quickly see patient has hearing aids and glasses and a cell phone, um, you know, making sure that they talk to the patient about let's make sure none of your belongings are on the tray um, and getting, getting that um, kind of putting that stopgap in place to try to prevent because definitely in the sheets when beds are changed and on a tray is where a lot of personal items are lost. And um, so I, I thought I would just kind of share that, that it that can be devastating to the patient, costly for them to replace, costly for the hospital, et cetera. So that was, it made um, a difference in the losses, but also just in communication and the patient just really feeling like the staff 
was on top of things and looking out for them on kind of a personal level too. So I thought I would share that too. Yeah, that that's great. That's an important, I mean, that is an important point. So then when the patient goes home, you could compare, okay, you had a hearing aid, you had a watch, that kind of thing. And then if something's missing, instead of acting like, I don't know anything about it, at least they can try to find it or apologize or do, or something, acknowledge it, right? Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Becky. Okay, so now we'll get into the overall hospital star rating. So first of all, let's just talk a little bit about why this was developed. You know, when you are looking to go to a restaurant, how many of you just get on your phone, do a Google search or buying products? I do this all the time when I'm on Amazon and you look at the rating, right? I mean, like on Amazon, I won't even buy anything if it's less than a 4.8, I think. It's sort of the same thing for hospitals. The star ratings was designed for the consumers so that they would have an easy way to know if the hospital that they think they're going to or going to has good quality. So that's the whole purpose. This was started in 2016, and there's been a recent change, which I'll talk about some of those changes uh, in, a, in a little bit. So it's, it's basically summarizing the care compare measures, which there are actually, there's over 100 care compare measures, although most hospitals don't have the data to report all of those. But under the star ratings, it's looking at 46 different measures that are combined. And just to know that more than 20% of hospitals, mostly the small and rural, consistently don't meet the threshold to being a rated uh, for having their rate calculated because there are the number requirements. Uh, so it's for the patient. It fits in with the other CMS star ratings. So there's star ratings for hospitals and clinics and home health and uh, hospice programs. And I think maybe one more. And it provides the summary of information for patients and consumers about existing publicly reported uh, data. So let me just um, say this before we get into the, the, <laughs> the graph. Some hospitals, so you can meet, like when you look, when you go to care compare and you look up a hospital or your hospital is there, you can, you have to meet thresholds to get your data on there, right? So you have to have at least 100 returned surveys for HCAPs or for some of the other measures, you have to have so many patients that fit into that. So for um, the four period quarter. So you could have data on just HCAPs, you could have information on overall quality star rating, or you might not, you'd have one or both, or you might not have any at all. I know I looked at, I'm in Minnesota here, and I looked at some of the star ratings. And <laughs> there is, there's quite a variety for critical access hospitals. And I also, uh, just this morning, I thought, well, I'm just curious on how the hospital's near me. So I plugged in my zip code, and I'm about, oh, I'd say like 25 miles south of Minneapolis. So I plugged in my zip code and I have like 19 hospitals within my area, including I think a couple of critical access hospitals. And I looked at their, their ratings and you know, some of the well-known big ones, their ratings aren't that fantastic. You know, so you can be rated for both overall, which is what we're talking about, O and or the age caps. Okay, so now let's look at this, the methodology. So there's seven step methodology. And let me tell you, this gets really complicated. So I'm not gonna get into the analytics. I just wanna give you kind of the high level of how they do this. So the first one is, and this was all um, determined through stakeholder and expert feedback is how they the, selected the measures and how they did the analysis for it. So the first step starts with um, 
the selected measures, which were standardized to be consistent in terms of direction and magnitude. The second step is the measures were organized into these five groups by measure types. So here you can see, yeah, look at the different measures. So they, they clumped them into mortality. So those are considered like outcome measures. Whoops. Safety of care, those would be like your HAIs, the readmissions, that's kind of obvious. And sometimes it goes for certain patients. Uh, types like readmissions for AMIs, for example, they also look at readmissions for colonoscopies because you know you, you really don't want a readmission after an outpatient procedure. Patient experience, so that's your HCAPs lumped in there. And then the timely and effective care. So that one is considered a process measure. Then, so that's step two in purple. Step three uh, is a simple average of the standardized measure scores. It's calculated and then this score is standardized to generate a group score. Step four in the little um, navy circle is a predetermined weight is then applied to each group score to calculate a hospital summary score. And I'll, I'll share a document that if you want to get into the nitty gritty about this, you can look at the more details because it is pretty um, complicated. And then step six is hospitals have to meet the reporting thresholds. And then they're organized into peer groups based on the number of complete measure groups that have submitted. So to even get on the star rating, you have to meet the threshold. Then, um, and so then you have groups that have three measure groups, the four measure groups, the five measure groups. And then the, the seventh score is, this is when they actually organize the five star categories for each peer grouping into a clustered algorithm. So there, that's where you would be rated one, two, three, four, five stars based on whether you were in the three measure groups, four measure groups, or the five measure groups. So if you have any questions about that, just ask Becky because um, she can dig in, no, <laughs> she can dig into the, the complications of it. But just know that the, it went through a technical expert panel and it went through stakeholder feedback and you know they're trying to make it fair and equal for hospital, you know, fair for hospitals and understandable, get a good score so patients, consumers can understand. So then recently, like I said, this all started in 2016, and then recently they've kind of done a little uh, update on things. And a paper just came out that was dated uh, July 2022, and I have that uh, linked on one of the slides as well, where a lot of this information came from. But they shifted from having seven measure groups to five. So the five are the mortality, uh, the patient uh, safety of care, readmissions, uh, patient experience, so that's the HCAPs. And again, you have to have the 100 surveys and then timely and effective uh, care. And that's where they consolidated measures like the effectiveness of care, the timeliness, efficient use of medical groups. That's the one that's considered process measures. And they don't feel that the others are uh, more outcomes. So process measures don't weigh as high as far as quality goes versus like say mortality or the HAIs, those kind of things. And let's see, mortality and readmissions, they come from the, uh, the Medicare fee-for-service claims. That's where CMS gets that data. So that's change number one. Change number two has to do with methodology changes. So this one has to do where CMS assigns each measure and in the overall star rating to one of the five mutually exclusive measure groups. So for example, now there are a total of 46 measures in for mortality. There are seven that they bring in to make one uh, measure for the Safety of care, there's eight, 11 for readmissions, eight for patient experience, 12 for timely and effective care. So it's, they put all those measures into the five categories and then that's where they roll things up to, to get one score. 
Okay, so um, for the, I'm, I'm still on this one, Becky, I kind of repeated myself on um, the five groups. So this one is where they, uh, to have an overall hospital star rating, you have to have a minimum of three measures in at least three groups, and one of those must be an outcome measure, like safety of care and mortality. So if a hospital doesn't have enough um, measures where you meet the threshold, you're excluded. Um, you know, the good news is it's trying to um, be as fair as they can, but you don't want to, they don't want to report when the data is so low. And that's why so many critical access hospitals are excluded from some of those measures. And Janelle, we did have a request for you to repeat the number of measures in each group. Oh, okay, sure. Um, let me see if I can find that quickly. Okay, here we go. Uh, mortality, seven. Safety of care, so that's like the HAIs, like the Cotty and the Clabsies. Um, N, the N is eight. Uh, readmissions, 11 measures. Patient experience, eight. So that's from the, the age caps. Timely and effective care are 12. And all those, if I added right, are 46. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay. All right, so um, yeah, and the note says critical access hospitals rarely meet the threshold for the, like the HAIs on care compare just because of the numbers. You know, when you think of like a central line infection, do you have a hundred of those um, in, that would that wouldn't be eligible for reporting in, in four quarters. Okay, methodology change number three. Okay, so this has to do with us um, after estimating the measure group score for each hospital in each group, then CMS calculates a weighted average to combine the five measure group scores into a single hospital summary score. So in the final weighting scheme was developed in collaboration with various stakeholder groups. So the stakeholders agreed that the outcome measure groups were more indicative uh, indicative of quality and thus should be weighted higher. So that's why you see higher percentage for the top four and the timely and effective care, which is a process measure that's weighted less. And again, if you didn't uh, report enough measures for a given measure group, the weights of those groups then would be redistributed proportionally across the groups for which the hospital did report. You know, so if you had Oh, you know, not as many readmissions or then those percentages would be changed a bit. Okay, the fourth uh, change had to do with the shift to a peer grouping approach to develop the star rating, they call it cut points. So the CMS peer groups hospital by number of measure groups for which they have at least three measures specifically after the minimum reporting thresholds are applied, then hospitals will be categorized into one of three peer groups. So a three measure group peer group, a four measure group peer group, and a five measure peer group um, group. So the, those three buckets. The star rating categories are structured such that the lowest group is one star and the highest group is five stars. The overall star rating methodology uses multiple iterations of clustering to achieve complete convergence. And that's when a hospitals no longer shift categories with additional iterations. So this would provide more reliable and stable star rating assignments. So they have a real complicated, in my opinion, complicated analysis of what they do when they're calculating things. And that is called K 
uh, what is it, K measure or K mix, something like that. K means is what it is. Yeah. Okay, so then um, these two links in the slide, the top one, uh, let, goes to the, the hospital specific reports. And when I went on there, even this morning, it didn't look to me like they have the latest reports out yet. It looks to me like they're still from uh, when they did them in 2021 based on the 2020 data. So uh, they're expecting to be updating those soon. And then uh, the second document is if you want more details on how, how things are calculated and how they came up with these changes, go to that document, that will be helpful. And they word some of it in fairly easy to understand language, uh, but it also gets pretty detailed. So critical access hospitals can request suppression of overall star rating from public reporting, but you have to do it. There's something called the preview period. And I think that still might be going on right now. And then some changes for the, when they do the July 2020 data release. There's just some things there. Uh, for one thing, they took out a couple of measures uh, from the timeliness and effective care measure group due to CMS meaningful measures initiative. So they took out OP30, which has to do with colonoscopy intervals um, with a history of uh, certain kind of polyps. And then they took out the ED2, which is the average, average time the patient spent in the emergency department after the doctor decided to admit them as an inpatient before leaving the department for the inpatient room. And then in recognition of the extraordinary circumstances faced by hospitals in the early stages of COVID-19 uh, pandemic, CMS granted hospitals exceptions for the first six months of 2020. Uh, so January 1 to June 36, 2020. So under this policy, these six months of data were excluded from all measure calculations for any purposes. So in other words, they could not be used for risk adjustment, cohort definition and outcome evaluation. So as a result, most measures moved the first two quarters of 2020 data from the reporting period. So they weren't there result, resulting in shorter measurement periods than normal. Some measures preferred uh, to reuse some of the entire uh, measurement period that was included in 2021 star rating calculations. You know, so there's just some kind of odd things that happened because of that. Um, the vast majority of hospitals still received an overall star rating and were categorized into the same peer rating group uh, provided uh, by the evidence, you know, provided evidence that, you know, it did. Uh, they did respond to um, the changes in the measures. Some things that were noted that there were 234 fewer hospitals that they think will receive a star rating with the Jan Jan July 2022 release. And also kind of noted that there were more one and two stars given for hospitals, including critical access hospitals. And it had to do with the recalculation and the different way of what some of the changes I just talked about. So I'm just curious, how many people on the call right now, your hospitals are getting overall star rating on Care Compare? You just like do a raise your hand or say it in chat. And I see we, my time says 12.03 Eastern. Yeah. Okay. So the, the last slide just shows some takeaways uh, related to the star ratings. Um, so the methodology, methodology has changed. Um, less than half the critical access meet the hospitals for a rating calculated. Although, like I said, there are, you know, some still are receiving the three to fours, but we do see more one to twos. And then, of course, just always looking for the availability of rural relevant measures is a significant concern because, I mean, you want people to know that you've got a great hospital and that you want them to be able to, to pick you because of good data. 
The last few slides in the deck are just uh, kind of generic resources that we offer. Um, there will be an update to the quality improvement basics soon. We're working on that now, but we'll be letting you know when that's available. Every month there's a, a MB Quip monthly uh, that will be coming out soon for August. And um, so Becky, I think I'll just stop talking if you have any further things you wanna say since we are so close on time. Yeah, we do have several hospitals that do receive a star rating, but the vast majority do not. And often when we do a deeper dive, um, you know, we just look at what can you actually, you know, impact, making sure that all your measures and any gaps are addressed for any of the measures that are included. And oftentimes it is that HCAPS survey um, that the number coming back that we're finding is something that hospitals potentially could impact that um, we try to work on, making sure that enough um, surveys come back so that a star rating can be calculated for that patient experience portion. Um, and Deb is sharing that they're really proud of their five-star rating attributed to both the Cater County Memorial Hospital and Margaret Mary Health. So thank you for that because we we uh, do have some hospitals with some really good star ratings. So appreciate you sharing that, Deb. Yeah, congratulations. So if you are doing a deeper dive um, and you want to talk through anything, let us know. We're glad to assist with star ratings too and um, help you figure out, are there elements that are included in the calculation that you can really make a change in? Sometimes you simply just don't have the patient volume for those particular measures come through, but there might be other areas where we can kind of take a look at and see if there are issues that can be addressed. So glad to help with that. So we'll end for today. Sorry for going over just a couple of minutes, but the the star ratings is complicated. I think the slide deck today does a nice job of going through what's included. Um, I will share the link to the area on uh, Care Compare where they discuss the star ratings so that you um, can go back and look at that resource too. But really want to thank Janelle for everything that she's provided today. And thank you for your time and want everyone to stay safe and keep your questions coming in. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful day.